Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. A pleasure to be here this morning with all of you folks here today. I wanted to start the presentation today just by a brief introduction of why the presentation is here. Uh, the open system architecture uh, paper and the presentation we're doing is a result of a need for a cable manufacturer to understand the cable performance in links, and in particular, to understand and support the warranty effort and the warranty programs that this cable manufacturer has. So a lot of this uh, paper is to talk about and investigate some of the uh, effects and impact of connectivity on the raw cable that's made by this manufacturer. So what I'm going to be covering today is a few points here. I'm going to talk briefly about some of the TAA background and some of the standards and activities that have been happening in this, uh, in this area. i uh, be talking about component ratings, verified versus uh, uh, compliant. Uh, some details about that. And then uh, the meat of the presentation actually is getting some of the interoperability testing that was done. It was a survey to evaluate performance across connectivity solutions and information valuable for the system warranty content and scope. Uh, it's valuable for the uh, cable manufacturer. I think it has a lot of value potentially for installers and users of systems as well to get a better feel for what they might expect in a uh, series of links and installations that would happen in any kind of a system structure install and, and, uh, and, and system. And then uh, lastly, talk about some of the manufacturer system warranties, key elements and attributes, and uh, to some extent how that information ties together with the, with the data we've gathered on some of the, uh, the link testing that was done. And then last, the summary. TIA standards and, uh, and structure. One of the things about TIA is that it has a wide range of uh, documents covering components, systems, infrastructure, et cetera. Uh, and IEC has a wide range of uh, documents as well that somewhat parallel the, the, the uh, TIA and, uh, and build a family of documents that gives a lot of guidance requirements and, and, and specifications as well for uh, cable installation in a varied uh, range of uh, applications and, uh, and structures. And of course, last but not least, is the Bixi accreditation standards and document structure that really augments and even adds to uh, the, the TIA structures. I was looking through uh, the uh, Bixi 002 standard 2014, and two things struck me just kind of random comments. And one is that, yes, they're talking about this next generation that we're going to be discussing briefly here in another slide or two, going to 2 gigahertz, 40 gigabit things, that's in the standard. And then I thought it was up to date in another way, that it also talks about managing structures to cover blasts and terrorist attacks. So that's an up to date standard. TI standards overview, uh, common standards with uh, cover building, installation, administration. Uh, a while you see the blue, the green, and yellow areas that cover some of the uh, uh, different segments of the standards. So it's a well-organized structure that talks about the component uh, standards, the common standards, the, uh, the premise standards, as well as components. Um, one of the things that I tend to, in my history, work most closely with is component standards particularly 568, which covers connectivity, cable, and, and uh, performance requirements for those, as well as requirements for the testing of those, uh, those, those cables as well. So it's uh, some of my experiences in the 568 and dealing with the requirements and expectations. So one of the things as part of the TAA is that, uh, and, and the industry as a whole, is to, from my view, watch the amazing transition of technology. Uh, I do remember when it was pretty amazing thing, just an amazing thing to get to 16 megahertz on Twisted Pair. And uh, struggling with all the, rec all the issues of trying to get that far and return loss issues, et cetera. And of course, that's been leapfrogged since then in a major way. Category 5E to 100 megahertz, category 6 to 250, category 6A to 500, and there's more. ISO IEC has similar cabling structures as well, and they go all the way to 1,000 megahertz, uh, which includes the Class F, FA, 600, 1,000 megahertz. Each one of those levels of performance requires a different level of process technology, um, technology, not only in the cable that I happen to be mainly dealing with, but also in the connect connectivity. 
It's also amazing what the connectivity manufacturers have done with connectors, taking an RJ45 that has some history, even back in audio baseband application, taking that product on up to 500 megahertz and even potentially 2,000 megahertz in the near future. And of course, the technical requirements grow up to next gen, category eight, or up to 2,000 megahertz over 30 meters. And then last but not least, that one of the things that deals with this presentation somewhat more directly is the proposed applications on existing infrastructure to two and a half or five gigabit per second using existing uh, systems. With that, we're able to expand the data rate on what's out there. And what's important about that is you need to understand what the links do, how they perform, and are they meeting requirements in order to meet those new possible applications on the existing infrastructure. So a key why to standards are out there. The, uh, certainly the com system, uh, common system component characteristics facilitate the cost, punch things out, make things common, make things cost effective, easy for the installer, easy for the user, easy to, under easy to understand. Interoperability for components, one of the key, si MS, one of the key reasons, and uh, somewhat pun intended, is the basic premise of the structured cable system to make things plug and play. And of course, it encourages mass production, economies of scale, and flexibility of use as well. And then that allows system warranties provided by various manufacturers, cablers, et cetera. And the consistency of, and certainly instills cons customer confidence and also provides a consistent and reliable performance across applications from day to day and, and year to year. One point of, uh, that uh, system warranty providers are concerned about is, is the products, the cable, connectivity, whatever it may be, are they not only compliant, but also it's an extra level of confidence that they're verified as well. Certainly a, a, a range of standards available out there or actually say organizations that will do this third party verification. But having that third party versus internal qualification to, uh, available adds a level of confidence to the, uh, to the componentry that's uh, really quite, uh, quite useful. And then for warranty systems, it's very common, if not real common, to uh, have components in the warranty required to have uh, this uh, verification of some sort by a third party. And again, these warranties do indeed rely on those verified components, components to assure performance. And warranties indeed are enhanced or even enabled by the standards and accreditation structure of TAA, IEC, BICSI, other organizations. In particular, folks like installers, certified installers, RCDDs, they are one of the key elements to make all this thing work and provide consistent quality workmanship to enable the performance of the components to shine through. Again, the warranty success does depend on the hardware performance as well as the installer. And of course, warranties are available through the certified installers as well. So part of the program is that the installers provide that warranty package as well. And that instills confidence in the market and provided by the standards and, and, and skills. So the project that I'm going to get into a little bit here was, uh, was initiated by a cable manufacturer's need to survey the uh, performance with, rec with uh, recognized connectivity manufacturers. So a number of widely used cable types and connectivity solutions were used, and the testing was done in permanent, config permanent link configuration. The point being that does the cable performance that the cable manufacturer provides, how does that change, how does it be affected by connectivity, at least as far as a permanent link environment? And understanding that is important, not only for the cable manufacturer, but also potentially installers, when you get the cable data back from an install, does it seem to be consistent with what would be expected overall? So again, the cable manufacturer offers a open system warranty. So the cable manufacturer is warranting products and systems and links across the number of different connectivity options. There was a need for assessment of the over, an overall assessment of link performance across those connectivity solutions. One is just, uh, how do you say, just make sure the system actually does work. Does it, does it, is it really plug and play? That was really expected, but 
does it also con confirm that the approval list, uh, the connectivity suppliers on, from the cable manufacturer, do they make sense? And also, it's a snapshot of the open system architecture performance overall for the cable manufacturer and various connectivity folks. So a 90 meter length of cable was chosen to establish a baseline. The cable with CAL connectors was tested on an automatic network, analy network analyzer system. Uh, to establish this baseline. Key electrical parameters were captured, including balance performance, and the vector network analyzer system was chosen in order to have a very robust and, and, uh, and low noise floor kind of a measurement system to get a good accurate reading on the cable itself. And the cable indeed test to have good margin to both the cable and the permanent link requirements. Conditions for the link testing. The permanent link was tested at 90 meters as well. In particular, we want to stress the same piece of cable, one piece of cable for this category six testing was used. And the field tester was used for testing. And the field tester was chosen, not particularly by brand, but it does reflect the kind of results that installers would get in the field. So we wanted that data to really reasonably match and the test procedures to really match what uh, you would see out there. So after the testing, all the frequency sweep data was exported, and analyzed, and uh, put into spreadsheets. And then the performance margins uh, in comparison to the cable measurements were summarized and, and provided in the, in the following charts. The particular link that was used was a two-connector model. Uh, the, um, um, the consolidation point was not used. So we just had connectors on each end of the 90-meter length of cable. So there were multiple, manufa multiple manufacturers for connectivity. There were six for category six UTP, six were chosen for category six A UTP, and there were three chosen for category six A FUTP. Another note is the six used for category six weren't exactly the same six as used for category six A. Uh, so we were trying to get a spread of some of the connectivity manufacturers. Multiple tests were done for each combination. And importantly, again, the same length of cable was used for all tests within the category family. There was only one category six cable used in all the testing you're about to see here, but the connectors were changed for each test. And the cables were listed and verified to 568C.2. The, the number of operators in the testing was limited. Uh, Operators follow good practices, minimum, minimum uh, cut back of the jacket, minimum untwisting of the pairs, short lead lengths, trying to make the testing as optimal as we could. And it was done in a laboratory type test environment to try to minimize any other variables as far as workmanship and conditions, et cetera. And then the other detail point is the cable was actually in air. So it wasn't in a metal rack, it wasn't on the floor, it was suspended in air, uh, similar to the TIA recommendation for measuring cable, try to minimize any other effects on the cable testing itself. So the category six cable baseline results look like this. So this is a chart. Uh, the horizontal scale is frequency in megahertz from a, a zero to 500. The uh, squiggly lines are the actual crosstalk results of the cable that was tested on the network analyzer system. And the solid blue line is the permanent link requirement. Now again, this is a category six cable, but it was tested to, two, to 500 megahertz in this particular case just to make sure it was kind of well behaved beyond 250, that there weren't any kind of resonances or something that might affect the results even below 250. So this cable actually performed uh, reasonably, well, actually very well out to, to 500, even though it's a category six cable. Um, so it gives you a sense of the baseline. It gives you a sense of how much margin there is in the, in the, against the permanent link for the starting point. So that's what the white space is between the blue line and the squiggly lines, is how much margin. You're talking about, uh, 
uh, roughly speaking, uh, 20 dB margin for the, for the cable to the permanent link. This is an example of the uh, return loss and uh, TCL baseline results in the cable. Uh, we see a very good performance as well for TCL, which is a balance of the two wires, how equal the two wires are, and return loss with the cable as well. These charts as well go to uh, 500 megahertz. One of the things that's actually impressive to me is that how far the connectivity manufacturers have come with, with connectors. Uh, you've got split pair effects to deal with legacy issues. You've got the uh, uh, increasing frequency bandwidth. So uh, it's just amazing to see what's happened on the connectivity front to match the continued expansion of frequencies, cross-tech requirements, and all the things go with enhanced data links, data rates in the uh, channels. Uh, so one of the things that uh, we were looking for in this is what differences do we see in the testing that would uh, perhaps be from connector to connector uh, that would interact with the cable design. We do believe there's probably some interaction with the cable design as well, and that was part of the study the cable manufacturers wanted to do is how does this cable work with the market connectors. I do want to make one point before I go with the charts here. This, we're going to see a lot of charts. And the point of this presentation is some things it is not. It is not a presentation to, to pick winners of connectors. It's not a test off for connectors. It's, uh, it's just a way to understand and do a survey of what the connectivity performance is going to look like. So you're not going to see the winner flag up here later on in the presentation. It's just a matter of what, how does this stuff work in a link. So what we see in uh, crosstalk was a, uh, a common theme among all connector manufacturers and all, and all testing is that you see on the left the cable test, which is a, the same data you saw before. And on the right, you see the, uh, the, the crosstalk curves after connectivity, uh, basically the permanent link test measured in the field tester. So a common thing that happens is you see a number of crosstalk combinations. The blue line on, on the right, kind of squiggly up there at the top, is almost unchanged from the cable itself. A couple other lines are coming down a little bit, a little bit less margin uh, compared to the cable. And then you see a couple of lines that are uh, significantly different than the cable spec and really kind of change shape. They're smoother and a little bit less margin. Now I say it's smoother, a little bit less margin. <laughs> There's still a lot of margin on this chart. There's still a lot of margin between the blue line and the, and the, and the cable crosstalk uh, performance. So we're not talking about a problem just talking about the effect of the connectivity on the overall link performance compared to the cable itself. Return uh, insertion loss uh, looks kind of like this. Again, frequency on the horizontal axis, dB attenuation, vertical axis. And what you see here is a, a very smooth chart. And this was typical across all the connectivity manufacturers. No lumps and bumps and shakes on this particular curve. So we had margin. We had good, reliable performance, consistent performance. So insertion loss was uh, very consistent across the uh, connectors. Here is a category six cable and, can, and the return loss. And we see the return loss uh, uh, also being reasonably consistent from the cable to the, to, the, uh, to the connectorized cable. Again, this is one particular example, but it was somewhat representative of what was seen across the, uh, across the testing. So this is a category six cable uh, connector ATCL. And again, we see some, some of the similar effects as crosstalk, but not nearly as much. And the results from cable to cable, or actually connector to connector, were, were uh, very consistent overall. So this is a chart they tell you to never put in a PowerPoint. Uh, but I think when you stand back and look at this, the point I'm trying to get across, this is a chart of near-end crosstalk. The vertical bars represent the margin of specification, happens to be one connector type, and you're looking at the combinations across there. You see one, two, three, six, the one, two, four, five, et cetera. And the message I'm trying to get across in this chart that surprised me, actually, is the vertical bars represent margin for crosstalk from test to test to test to test. Same cable, same connector manufacturer. Take a connector off, put another one on, Results can change by 5, 10, 15 dB. So we see a lot of variability on this particular 
on, on this graph. And so we'll get into some more detail, explain some of the nuances a bit. But the takeaway here is that the bars go up and the bars go down, and same cable, same connector manufacturer. This is a similar graph of the uh, return loss margin example, where we see the, uh, on the horizontal axis, you see test one, test two, test three, test four, et cetera. So we're looking across different connectors that were tested on that same cable. And you're looking at margin uh, to specification for return loss on the main and the remote. And what you see there is, although the main is a little bit different than the remote, which is not unexpected, also, what you do see is that once it's kind of settled in with a particular cable connector configuration, it's reasonably consistent from test to test to test. So changing connectors to another set of connectors gets you pretty much the same result. So return loss was rather consistent from test to test to test. TCL, balance. Again, consistent across the test for, and it was typical of all the connectivity manufacturers. What actually surprised me a little bit, because in making cable, you're worried about extrusion, insulation diameters. Uh, managing balance can be a, a complicated issue sometimes. And of course, the split pair on the, on the green on, for 568B is, is a challenge and on those other kind of things. So the connectivity manufacturer have done a really great job in, in maintaining balance performance uh, when I thought there might be more of an issue with that, given the problems they have in trying to manage all the configuration of the wires. So next, permanent link performance variability. All connector types, all connector types had variations from test to test. But not all connector types had the same variation characteristics. So each connector manufacturer has their own way of doing cancellation, uh, shielding, whatever it may be, to optimize performance in the particular connector design. They all met requirements. There was no problem issues here. But they, you can see not the detail of what they do in the connector, but you can see the effects of different optimization schemes, as it were, in the connect connectivity. That each one had a kind of its own flavor of how it reacted, particularly with near end crosstalk. And no one connector stood out across all the, all the combinations. One connector might have a great 1278, another connector might have a great 1236. Uh, it kind of varied around a little bit. So looking at an example of this, uh, we see that uh, for uh, this is a crosstalk margin variation for pins 1, 2, 3, 6. I chose this because it happens to include the split pair uh, and, the, uh, and the orange pair. So it's an orange-green combination here. And so what you see is that uh, connector A and connector D tend to have a bit more variability, perhaps arguably, than the rest of the connectors on there. Uh, they all have great margin to spec, no, no issues there. No star passes, by the way, on any of these tests that we did. Um, but you see differences in the way the connectors are tuned. So you might say, well, oh, connector A, connector D, you know, got some problems. But then you switch to 1278, and you see that uh, the, 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 the charts kind of change a little bit as, a, as, a, as the way the connectors are optimized, and, and also importantly, how the connectors may indeed be reacting with a particular cable design at hand. Also in a 3645 example, so again, the vertical bars margin the requirement across the horizontal axis. You're seeing test one, test two, test three, test four, et cetera. And here on the 3645 combination, we tend to see a lot more, more consistency in that particular combination. And interesting connector F, which on some of the other charts had very consistent performance, tends to bounce around a little bit more than, uh, than some of the others. So it all depends on the connectivity, kind of how they're tuned, and those kind of things. So even with the same cable from test to test, Near and crosstalk had the most variability by far compared to the other parameters. TCL, return loss, insertion loss are much more consistent from connector to connector, connector. All tests indeed met permanent link requirements with, with, uh, with margin, not really not an issue. Variability did not seem to matter whether you were talking about remain data or remote data. Very, very similar in pattern, either, either main or remote. 
So before I leave this slide here, I want to comment is that, yeah, we saw no problems, no failures, but it's important for the cable manufacturer to understand how the cable acts in a link. And I think it's also important for those provided, who are provided the warranty understand some of the data. So when the data is, is, is pulled from a installation, from a structure, and you get all the link data, there's at least another baseline out there to compare to on does the data look sensible compared to what you might expect in the field. So it's a baseline, it's a survey, it's not uh, uh, DOE, et cetera, as it were, but it, I think it does help the cable manufacturer understand warranty package and feedback to the installer as well might be useful to say, does this installation data make sense? The same procedure was followed for 6A and uh, uh, UTP and FUTP testing. Uh, the same procedure was followed for Category 6A components, which was a 90-meter baseline test on the cable, 90-meter links tested with a two-connector arrangement, consistent operator and termination techniques were used as well in this system here. So in 6A, what we saw is that the consistency from test to test was much, much greater compared to the Category 6. The swings in crosstalk performance were much smaller and more consistent test to test to test. We also saw the insertion loss, um, TCL, return loss were consistent like the other parameters were as well. So we saw somewhat of a striking difference between 6A and Category 6. I don't know what the reasons are exactly. My, my hypothesis is that a lot of it is because the cables are designed for uh, alien crosstalk, noise immunity, twist lengths in Category 6A cables are much, much tighter. So probably the interaction, the way connectivity is designed and the cable works was just a little bit different than a Category 6 cable that doesn't have the same design constraints for noise reduction, tight lays, and alien crosstalk as Category, category 6A does. So we did see, indeed, a lot more consistency across the uh, performance for a particular co connector. But importantly, though, not all connectors were the same. So we saw connector A manufacturer had uh, 10, 12 dB margin across all the tests, very consistent. Connector D was an example where we had maybe 5 dB or so margin across the board. And then connector F was uh, maybe 8 or 10. So if I saw, showed all the combinations, you would see some a little higher or lower. Again, it's a based upon optimization of the connectivity and how the, the connectivity manufacturer chose to design the, uh, the, the connector, and again, how the connector interacts with the cable that's under test. So more consistent crosstalk with 6AF UTP, but not always the same. Again, consistency and other parameters, return loss, TCL, et cetera. And again, I think alien crosstalk is one of the key things that leads some of the difference in performance, just the way the cable is designed. Next up is uh, also analysis of FUTP. And here was concern, or question, I should say, not much really concern, but a question on how do, would a shielded cable design interact with the connectivity? Would it be different? Would it be the same? Uh, there is an effect of the shield, there's an effect of grounding of the, of the connector. Connector bodies are, are, are metalized or metal, so you've got a ground plane right near the, the pins, et cetera. So the question was, just, is, this, is this any different? And the answer is, at least in the testing that was done so far, not a lot. You still saw uh, variability in crosstalk. So here on this particular chart, you see test one, test two, test three, test four. And you see the results from connector A, B, and C, and you see that the crosstalk does indeed vary uh, quite a few dB as you go from one connector to the next connector to the next connector on the same exact piece of cable. So the Category 6A FUT, FUTP looked a lot like Category 6. I will say this, for a lot of 6A UFUTP cables, the insides look a lot more like a Category 6 than a 6A. So the cable structure internally under the shield 
probably represent, resembles a category six more than a 6A, 6A UTP, I should say. So this FUTP data was similar to the category six UTP data and uh, variable crosstalk results from test to test. We had consistent data for other parameters, return loss, insertion loss, TCL, et cetera. And all conductivity pass <coughs> combinations do indeed pass the industry permanent link requirements. So one of the things that out of this testing is that we do, the cable manufacturer was able to verify good electrical performance across the range of cables they manufacture, which allows the user the option of selecting the connectivity. Uh, you can choose it on cost, you can call uh, manufacturer support, ease of installation, the way it's designed. So you've got that flexibility on choosing connectivity uh, that uh, makes a lot of sense for, for the installers and for users. And importantly, the question was, does the data support and, and give confidence to a cabler, off, the cabler offering a warranty, and certainly it does. So we understand what the variability is, and not only do we have data that says the, connect, the systems work, we have data that says, hey, they work in this manner, and it offers kind of a benchmark for further testing or comparing testing of actual installed installations. Key warranty system attributes. You know, a warranty system requires um, standard component compliance verification. Most warranties do include verified componentry rather than just uh, certified or, or, or a compliant componentry offers that third-party verification, offers a confidence level that supports the warranty being offered. It does indeed provide a guaranteed performance level for uh, installed systems uh, that allows the, uh, the user and the installer to have confidence in the system and the structure and the components, and it's going to work very well at the end of the day. It does offer advantages, and it gives you uh, supplier resources, system support, technology, capabilities, product information, et cetera. One of the important things as well is it establishes a chain of communication for system performance and maintenance. So if you have a challenge or a problem with the, uh, with the installation or data you're kind of questioning as well, you've got some place to go to understand the data, ask questions, and indeed compare it to what the data may be, should look like based on what you're getting, compared to what you're actually getting in the installation, if there are questions about the installation data. Helps establish the responsible parties for problem resolution. So if there is something issue, you know where to go. Uh, you have some uh, 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 channels on which to, which to follow. Helps establish a set of components and systems with reliable performance. In this example, the cable manufacturer has a number of connectivity manufacturers that are used with the cable. And uh, so looking from that reasonably broad set of options, then you know you've got a set of options that actually work together. Then also a warranty often provides a location for essentially a third party location for storing the data. So you get the link data, send it in to the, uh, the warranty provider. They look it over, make sure that the links are, are compliant and, and make some sense. And that is a, often, if not very often, a, a key step in actually getting the warranty uh, the warranty uh, um, uh, finalized and, and in force. And importantly, on warranty channels, because you have the background data, you've got the link data, you know what, it, uh, what the data is, it's really a key step in, in supporting multiple and new applications. I mentioned earlier about the two and a half and the five gigabit systems that are maybe coming down the pike on existing infrastructure but only if they really are still compliant with the requirements for the links and, and, uh, and channels. So if you have the compliant system links, then you've got opportunity to upgrade the data rates potentially in the future as this technology holds. And, uh, but without that documentation, without that, you have to go back and retest. There'd be kind of a, uh, 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 
uh, roll of the dice where the, the new application would actually work properly and reliably. It offers uh, access to training resources, product-specific knowledge, scope of covered products, and certainly hands-on opportunities to look at uh, products and connectors and systems, et cetera, and, uh, and give you some feedback and, and insight into what, uh, what may be the best way to use the, the product and the cable. So open warranties have some advantages. Open warranty meaning you've got a manufacturer, particularly a cable manufacturer, off, off, offering warranties ag across a number of different connectivity solutions. So you can choose the, uh, the product to meet your needs, your installation needs based on your choices and preferences for product design, connector design, whatever it may be. Offers you flexibility for, for the few and system integrators. And also, uh, it, it, all those warranties are indeed backed by the industry standards, specifications, and structure that we talked about. The TA, the IEC, the Bixi standards offer the, uh, the infrastructure in which all this thing all works together. There are also closed solutions. They have advantages, certainly, and sometimes some drawbacks. Uh, for instance, uh, some closed solutions are a specific subset of uh, open solution uh, available elsewhere. And there are fewer closed solutions from one manufacturer than there are closed solutions from multiple manufacturers. So sometimes cablers, connector people, you know, kind of team up and come up with a, with, a, with a warranty structure. That's all good, but then you tend to have a closed system uh, warranty that has advantages and possibly disadvantages. Closed solutions sometimes are multi-company, they can kind of come and go. Gives you a limited product and uh, performance options in some, some occasions. And it also does offer some warranty restrictions as far as out-of-network products and, and, uh, and may indeed risk the entire project warranty. Accredited installations are rather important, I would think. So the things you are doing, managing the system, documentation, moves, add changes, et cetera, is really vital to making sure a system uh, maintains integrity, is manageable, upgradable, and you can go in and, and do the, uh, this kind of support that's uh, needed over time in the network. So when you look at uh, warranties, I think it's important that uh, you read the warranty first. You don't have to sign the warranty to know what's in it. And you, don't have a test, and you don't have a pen that's powerful enough to change the warranty after you sign it. So does it have a limited time or even a few days to notify a warranty provider of problems? Does it have the ability to transport warranty from one building owner or one structure owner to another if the, if the uh, building or the, or the owner uh, changes hands? Is it void if you use components out of a box that are more than a few months old? Do you have a choice of components to best meet the user overall needs, whether yourself as an installer or the customer or the, or the final client in the building and the structure? Does it provide the training resources that would be eligible for things like Bixie Credit? Does it have a milestone date where the warranty actually starts and works? and is in force? And does it have, avail does it have availability of uh, support resources, installer, component, manufacturer, et cetera, to help you along in getting the, uh, the, the, the job done and the, the finalization of the uh, project completed and signed off? And uh, does it have coverage for link portion or end to end? So in summary, a link for test results confirm that performance indeed meets requirements, but there are differences, and I think the differences are important to understand to give the installers and the cable, warranty, cable manufacturer and the warranty providers a sense of what to expect and whether things are as they should be expected or a little bit different. There, are, there is variability in test to test, even with a relatively controlled environment, and the testing that was done, both 6 and 6A links, and indeed, this is from componentry that was all verified by a third party. Uh, by a third party. Then warranty decisions. You know, just have knowledge of the warranty coverage, details, requirements, limitations within the warranty for timing, key events, et cetera, that you've got uh, your, your basis covered. 
use the components with third-party verification, and maintain your flexibility in choosing your components and installers as makes sense for you. Thank you.